Hi folks, uh, welcome to the tea time shift of Online Farm Sunday. I'm Farmer Tom and together with my wife Mrs Farmer Tom, my parents and our amazing farmhand Joe, uh, we look after this part of Cambridgeshire on the Cambridgeshire and Northamptonshire borders and we have some cereal crops and we look after a few sheep as well. Today I'm going to show you all of those as well as the amazing work we do to protect the countryside around us. Um, but first of all, I thought I'd introduce you to a friend of mine. We've only recently become friends because this little lady was only recently born. She's, she's two days old. Uh, she was born to one of our pet sheep who's a Zwarble um, and she's a lovely healthy lamb. She's got another twin who's just over there. Um, they might call out to each other. And you can see because she's got a bit of Zwarble, now Zwarble is a, is a breed of sheep, she's got a little bit of a few grey hairs on her forehead. That'll eventually turn into a bit of a badger stripe. So, we're, But we're doing an important job today. Uh, within kind of 24 to 48 hours of our lambs being born, we dock their tails and that's what I'm going to do or try to do for you here. Now like many things in nature when we look in the beautiful British countryside we think uh, they just kind of it all just happens and it's wonderful and uh, and uh, and wild but that's not often the case uh, and it's the same with, with sheep when you see grown-up sheep they generally don't have long tails like this they're born with long tails like that but because they have lots of wool if they um, if we leave them with long tails they're likely to get covered in poo they can get flies in the back end there, which is not very nice. Sorry, I, I know, I'm so sorry, I'm broadcasting your bottom. It's not okay, is it? Um, I'll, try to, I'll try to avoid doing that. Um, and so we put one of these little orange rubber rings on uh, and all that does is it just tightens around the tail and after about two weeks, the tail drops off. So I'm gonna try to do that. It's a village farm first here. We normally uh, have at least two pairs of hands. And as you can see, I'm gonna use this tool, which just opens the rubber ring out and I'm going to put it along the tail. It's quite important to get the, 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 the placement of the ring well. Um, if, it, if it's too far down, then we're not really doing a proper job and uh, then the tail can still uh, hold on to, to poo uh, and muck and still attract flies. If it's too short, the tail doesn't do its job, which is not only signal to other sheep, but also to protect, it, protect her bottom. So um, we're going to put it on about here. Not normally a one-handed job. Easy, easy, my girl. Well done. Okay, whoops. Nope, that was there first. That's it. Okay, yeah, that's right. Well done. Well done. You did so well. Okay, and we'll just pop it on there. Roll the band off. I know. Feels like a little restriction. And there we are. So what will happen? We'll return this lamb back to her mother. That um, rubber ring will just apply some pressure and after about two weeks the tail will drop off. Years ago they used to let the lambs grow for a few weeks, uh, cut the tails off and make, uh, make a pie out of them. Um, that's not what we do nowadays. It's not acceptable uh, and we, we dock, them, dock their tails at this stage. Fortunately she's a little girl. If she was a little boy we would be performing another operation uh, in the same way, so relatively painless. Uh, and just allowing us to, um, to to castrate them as well. Anyway, I'm going to um, try and manoeuvre now te with technology. I'm going to hand the lamb back to Mrs. Farmer Tom. I'm going to say thank you very much. Well done. She's just off now to go and take the lamb back to her mother. Hi there, Jamie Master Roberts. We've got you on board. And I would say also, let me just turn turn around and uh, there we go. Uh, I would say also, if you've got any questions today about anything, I'll be reading along at the bottom of the screen as best I can. Um, so just let me know if you've got any questions. Read them in there, uh, write them in there, and I'll be reading them out as we go along. But what I thought I'd do first, um, I'm up in one of our crop fields uh, of spring barley, but I thought I would just introduce you to, uh, to all of the different crops that we have. And now instead of tramping around all the fields, I've, I actually, because I thought we'd be having Open Farm Sunday on our site here, I've prepared... Uh, a whole line of crops. I've grown them myself. Um, uh, I've irrigated them over the watering can every day and I thought we'd just go down there and what I'll do is I'll just introduce you to the crops uh, and then I'll tell you what their what their typical their common use is. So let me just do a little turn around and you might be able to guess what some of these are. You might have seen some of them in fields around you. So the first one I'll, I'll tell you this is a, a field of spring barley which will give you a great hint as to what this first plant might be. So this is also spring barley. You can see actually a, a big difference. So this, this spring barley here um, is uh, a little bit lighter 
uh, and it's a little bit shorter. And the reason for that is I've only grown it in a little tub like that. And whilst I've watered it every day, it's had plenty of water. Um, it hasn't been able to put deep roots down, which this crop has, uh, and to access, um, access all the lovely nutrients. So as you can see, it's looking a little bit anemic. But this is our spring barley. We sell this um, to go to make Budweiser beer. Um, hooray. Um, but barley can be used for lots of other things. It can be used for animal feed uh, and it can be used to make Maltesers. I was watching Jake Freestone this morning at Overbury uh, talking about Maltesers and uh, I think we determined from that, that that men and women both love Maltesers, so that's fantastic. We'll move along to the next one. Now these are in full flower. I wonder if you can uh, guess what they are. Um, now these are beans. Um, they're, as you can see, they're, they're coming into flower, which is fantastic for our pollinators. Um, we don't have a lot of beans. We've got a small field of about, which is about 10 football pitches in size. Um, and these beans will be harvested. Uh, well, actually, our beans will be harvested probably later in the summer. And these, a lot of beans from the UK are exported to North Africa for human consumption. But again, they can be used um, also for animal feed as well. Um, I've got a friend, Fr hi Franek if you're watching, uh, who knows a lot more about beans and peas than I do, so I'm a little bit hesitant with this, but um, these, these beans are looking uh, pretty good at the moment. As you can see, I've been watering them hard, so we wouldn't get that here. We, we use no irrigation on our farm. Uh, we, we rely on the, the, the rainfall, so, um, so we'll come on to that. And Wendy, I'll talk about regenerative farming uh, and no-till a bit later on. Um, moving on to our third crop now, I wonder if you can guess what these are. Now, these have got lovely blue flowers. They've just gone past flowering. They're just starting to form the seed head at the top there. And this is linseed. Uh, we've grown linseed for a few years on this farm. It's a fantastic crop. You may have heard of linseed oil, um, which, uh, which is a fantastic oil that lots of people use for different purposes. Um, but our linseed generally is exported to France for use in bread making. They use it a lot over there. Um, so that's what our linseed. If you see a field that's completely blue at around this time of year, it's likely to be linseed. And, and the linseed flower generally opens up in the morning and by about mid to late afternoon, so about now you can see it's closing up again. Uh, so it's open during the daytime to be pollinated and then it closes up at night time. It's an amazing, an amazing plant. Now moving on, I think our fourth type of crop that we have here, you might be able to guess what they are because you can start to see the seed heads already forming. This is a crop which you may have as part of your breakfast cereal. Uh, it's a crop which is famously fed to horses um, and I'm sure it has lots of other uses as well. These are oats and as you can see that's, that's the oat heads just starting to form. Um, we've, we grow a small amount of oats on our farm and these are spring oats and, and I can see a question there about the difference between spring barley and, and winter crops. So we, we call our crops either spring or winter crops and it's to do with the time of year that they are, uh, that they are planted. So actually these are all spring sown crops, but there are winter oats and there are spring oats. And I'm gonna give you a big word in a minute, but our winter, the winter varieties, there are different types of the crop and the winter crop varieties need to go through winter. They need to have a cold period in order for them to shoot on and then grow. They need to vernalize, that's a very long word. Um, but it basically it, said, it shows the importance of having a cold winter. This year we didn't have much of a cold winter and we'll talk about weather in a moment, but that was, they were oats. They were the fourth of our crops. I wonder how many of you have oats of some sort for your breakfast. Uh, now the fourth crop here, as we move on, many of you might recognize these. Um, they are peas. You'll probably see them, maybe some of you will have them growing in your garden. These are field peas, so they'll be harvested when they're dry. Um, obviously, most of the time when you eat peas, you might eat them frozen or, or fresh from the pod. Uh, and you'd eat, them, uh, uh, you'd eat them in their green form. These will be harvested when they're dry. Um, they go on for similar, similar purposes as the beans back here. And beans and peas are great plants. They're both legumes, and legumes put nitrogen from the air back into the soil, so farmers love them. It's a great way to get some fertiliser naturally, uh, naturally in there. I can see Caroline Drummond saying, linseed oil is fantastic for cricket bats. It is. Uh, on our farm, my father, when I was much, much younger, planted a stand of cricket bat willows, thinking that when I played for England, uh, I would be able to, uh, to use a bat fashioned from a, a tree on our own farm. Unfortunately uh, for me, I've never played for England, but fortunately for the trees, they are still very much extant. They are in existence uh, and doing well. So those are peas. They are our fifth crop. And I'm going to move along to the final crop. These, this is wheat. 
This is probably the most commonly grown crop in the UK. This is a variety of spring wheat, and as you can see, I plant, well, actually I planted it uh, about the middle of March and it's just shooting up now, and it won't be long before it starts to form an ear. The barley at the beginning is already in ear, and the oats, as you saw, we, we, we call that in ear when the seeds are starting to form. Um, so we've got three plants along here that are in flower. They are the beans, the linseed, which was blue, and the peas here. We've got two trop crops which are in ear, so the barley, you could just start to see the little bits of barley forming, and the oats. And the laggard at the end here is our spring wheat. Looking a little bit sorry for itself, when you look at a plant, it should look a lovely deep green colour. Uh, it shouldn't have these yellow wispy bits at the top. Uh, and that probably is to do with one of, one of two things. One is the fact that it's pretty dry. Um, uh, and uh, even though I've been watering this most days, it's probably lacking uh, in moisture and a little bit of nutrients because you can see it's only, it's only in, a, in a shallow pot there. Um, so yes, it's probably lacking in, in water and nutrients. So that's a little rundown of some of the crops that we and many other farmers grow across the United Kingdom. We've got barley at the end there, beans, linseed, oats, peas and wheat. And I forgot to say uh, what wheat is used for. Um, I'm sure many of you can guess. Um, the, the thing that we most commonly associate with growing wheat is, uh, is bread making. And probably about half of our wheat, they have to be particular varieties of wheat, um, about half of our wheat um, goes for bread making. The other, half, the other half of our wheat actually goes to a factory where they extract a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the, 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 the compounds within there. So if you've, ever been into, if you've been, ever been unlucky enough to be in hospital in the United Kingdom, uh, and been on a drip, then the, the factory that we send our wheat to actually extracts all that glucose and the glucose in your drip will, uh, uh, will most likely have come from that factory. They supply a lot of the, um, the, uh, the medical glucose. Uh, question there, are you able to harvest these crops all yourself? Well, we have a, uh, a combine harvester. It's a green combine harvester. I've uh, put my uh, John Deere jacket on because I understand they're a sponsor of Leaf Online Sunday, which is fantastic great company um, supporting British farmers which is great um, and we have a combine harvester of them some of you may have watched a television show called Bull Mucky um, which I was delighted to be on and uh, during that time of filming we bought a new combine harvester and it is a combined harvester so that means it does all the jobs of harvesting that used to be done by different machines so it cuts the crop uh, it threshes it so it takes all the seed away from the straw and then it stores that seed in its tank ready to go back into the trailer, back to our grain store. So it's a combined harvester, but it also has lots of different settings. And that means that we can harvest all those crops that you saw behind me with that one machine, just a flick of the button and uh, uh, we can move on to another crop. So that is quite uh, wonderful. It's a real miracle of technology. And uh, we try to use technology on our farm um, to make jobs easier, to make our farming more efficient uh, and to basically also ensure that we can look after the countryside whilst producing um, uh, good yielding crops. And one of the things I thought I'd do today um, is show you one of my favorite bits of the farm. And I say this with no hesitation, um, a lot of the um, areas of the farm that we allocate to wildlife are my absolute favorite bits. So our farm is about the size of perhaps 500 football pitches and 25 of those are allocated to growing crops specifically for wildlife. The main two types of crop that we grow are, um, first one is our pollen and nectar mix. So we grow basically lots of flowers for our butterflies and bees, our pollinators. And actually don't forget that uh, we have beetles and moths and flies and all sorts of other things which help us pollinate as well. Uh, and the second crop that we grow um, is an overwintered bird mix and we grow a special mixture of seed bearing plants. We might grow some of those ones that you've seen earlier uh, and we leave them through the winter so that the birds have plenty to feed. Um, and one, there, there are two, um, two main causes of bird decline. Um, one is a predation and the other is a lack of food through the winter. They call it the hungry gap. So during February and March when the birds are particularly hungry, the areas of crop that we, that we plant and leave for them provide seeds and food and shelter for them to, um, uh, to live in. But what I'm going to show you here, and I will show you again in a moment, is, um, is some of our pollen and nectar mix. I'm going to turn it around. You don't need to see me in, anymore for a moment because although I am glorious in some ways, this is all the more glorious. 
This is a pollen and nectar mix and within this you can see lots of amazing flowers um, which is uh, uh, abundant and diverse for our, for our pollinators. You can see uh, white clovers and red clovers, there's a yellow trefoil over here. I can see some lovely vetch a bit further away in the distance. You've got some uh, daisy here. This is a, um, a flower called sanfuan. Uh, which actually means holy hay. Uh, a lot of people grow sanfuan, which is this lovely, lovely flower here. Um, they grow it for um, uh, for forage for their for their um, uh, for their stock. That could be for their horses or for their cattle. Um, and it's a very sweet, lovely crop. Um, you've got some vetch here um, with that beautiful, beautiful pink flower. Uh, and this is, without doubt, my favourite favourite one of the, my favourite things that we do on the farm. Um, now we're right in the middle of a field here. I'll just do a little loop round. There's a big heap of poo over there. We might go and look at that in a minute. Bit of woodland, but we are actually right in the middle of the field here. And um, what I've actually done is planted this strip right the way down the middle of the field because we recognise that whilst uh, we grow uh, about 25 football pitches worth of, um, of this crop, it's really important where we put it. We could just plonk it all in one corner, but actually animals need to, animals and, and, and bugs, beetles, insects, etc., need to migrate around the farm. They need to get about. They need to have um, access to different areas. So you can see, we'll see in a minute, a pond and a bit of woodland over there. And also we need them to help us. So uh, a lot of our smaller um, wild friends can only really um, travel about 50 meters off into the crop and one of the things that are, are that the beetles and bugs can do is they can uh, they 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 are predators for the the bugs that are harmful to our crops so it helps us to reduce uh, the amount of chemical input that we have on our farm we actually haven't used insecticide here for for many years and it's I think it's part of initiatives like this that help us to reduce our insect burden or our, the, uh, our burden of insect pests um, and even a good old thistle uh, is fantastic fantastic home for wildlife uh, and that helps us to um, uh, basically it helps us to to um, to protect our crops grow healthy um, uh, healthy strong crops uh, but more naturally and without uh, with a reduced input when Caroline Drummond was on first thing this morning she was talking about IPM that is integrated pest management and that basically means we use a range of different tools and techniques to grow healthy crops that are safe traceable uh, and we get to care for the environment at the same time and this is one way that we can do that and what I'm walking along here for gosh it's a lot just to walk and talk a lot isn't it like this um, is we're going to walk along and look at a pond and we'll look at two ponds today I'm going to show you first of all this pond up here That's right, so Tony, actually, this, this is fantastic also for, for nesting birds, and um, we, we'll see a lot along here. We're really trying to um, focus on certain species. Um, the grey partridge, the English partridge, is um, has been declining in the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, it's a European red list species, uh, and it loves areas like this. Uh, it likes it when we divide the field up, um, so that's what we've been trying to do. And as you can see, the, the, um, the strip extends there right over into the distance to the other side of the field. So we've put a six metre strip right the way down the middle there. A question, do you get any problems with aphid from the cover? Uh, we haven't as yet. Um, we're actually starting to grow more. Uh, we've got a variety of wheat that we're um, investing in in the autumn, which is resistant to uh, one of the main diseases that aphids carry. Um, but we actually find that um, that instead of like in the perhaps in the bad old days if we saw an insect we might spray for it it actually takes quite a, a high level of infestation before it really starts to negatively impact the crop so um while you just soak up the uh, the beautiful view here um i'll catch my breath it's a little bit windy so i hope you can hear me okay we're actually looking over there um we're in cambridgeshire here looking over into northamptonshire so um it's pleasing that we have uh, i think three cambridgeshire farmers represented today uh, it is the queen of the counties, I won't hear uh, anything else said, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's great to look over into beautiful, beautiful Northamptonshire over there. Anyway, back to this pond here. So we have in recent years realised that water is uh, a really important um, facet of our production. It's really important to our crops. You can see the crops looking a, a, um, a little bit thirsty, although we've had a bit of rain recently. And 
um, it's also really important to our wildlife. Now we have, because we um, have been quite, um, uh, in the past we had a lot of grassland on our farm, we maintained all our field ponds, uh, but they were starting to silt up in recent time. And so in the last few years we've been digging them out. But one of the important things we've been trying to do uh, in order to care for the environment when we do that is to ensure that 10% of the pond remains undug. Um, I'll t tell you another concept now, it's, it's referred to as a green bridge. So a green bridge is basically some vegetation like this which provides a, a bridge, it provides a home for some of our wildlife um, to go from one season to the next, from one crop to the next or from basically from one time period to the next. And if we dug out this entire pond it would all look like this and it takes a little while for the vegetation to recolonize. We dug this pond out in late summer last year and it's a very bleak uh, place up here. Well, you can see, although the skylarks don't think it, they're quite happily uh, flying away and uh, singing across there in the distance. Maybe you can hear them singing um, uh, in between my, uh, my inane chat. But um, if, we, if we dug this entire pond out and we didn't leave a green bridge, we didn't leave some of the vegetation intact, not only would there be, um, it would be bare ground for a longer period of time, but our insects, our wildlife, our butterflies and bees would have no home. They'll be made completely homeless. So we've started to do that on our ponds uh, as we dig them out and to, and to basically bear in mind that we need to make sure that we leave, uh, we spare enough space for our wildlife, our butterflies, our bees, uh, our insects, our bugs, all those kinds of things which I've started to get uh, increasingly excited about. Um, yes, I'm a soil geek, but we're also uh, nature geeks as well. So as you can see, that is really abundant, it's vibrant. You can see the, the reeds there, um, uh, the trees and the bushes behind, and we planted a few more trees. You can see the little um, covers there. Uh, we planted them. On our farm, we're aiming to plant a thousand new trees this year. Um, we're about 250 at the moment, and we'll plant a fair few more in the autumn. Um, but as you can see, what you'll see in a moment when we get down to, um, uh, to, to the second pond, is you'll see what this pond could look like another year. So six months after being dug out, there are already, um, there's already greenery starting to, uh, to recolonize. Although the first thing I can see is a thistle. What you might be able to see is lots of insects in there. I can see some little water boatmen that have obviously hatched just in the last few days. Um, I can see some reeds starting to recolonize. Uh, where are we? Over here. Uh, and the grass is starting to come back into the pond. And although you perhaps can't make it out with the um, <laughs> Uh, with the picture here, I can see weeds starting to grow up in that pond and I can see life there which is really really important to maintain. We don't want to wipe anything out because it's so much difficult to, more difficult to bring it back again. So that's our green bridge uh, and uh, that's our, um, uh, our wildlife strip. Now it goes right down the middle of the field um, so we do have to be careful to protect it. Um, uh, we, we, on our farm we might use a sprayer to apply nutrients or plant protection products and uh, so we have to be very precise to make sure that we protect these areas to ensure that they're doing their job. I mean, they're doing some fantastic things. They're looking after predators uh, that help us to reduce the insect pest burden. Um, they're providing a nice habitat, a nice windbreak as well. Um, and also there's lots of, um, uh, lots of legumes in here. We mentioned legumes earlier and they're great for taking nitrogen from the atmosphere and putting them into the ground. And also if we do get, um, uh, so if, if, we, if there's a chance that we might lose some nutrients from our crops here, uh, if they, they're generally held on to over the winter um, by these plants. Look at that, just feast your eyes on that. It's absolutely beautiful. I don't think the picture does it justice. Um, but this little um, green bridge is just a riot of colour from April through really as far as November. So, um, so it's great. Uh, and, and that's even despite it being such a dry year this year. You can see uh, the crops are looking um, pretty sparse when we look in above them. Uh, there's not a very thick um, stand of crops, but because you've got such abundant diversity here, um, look at how they're doing even after the driest, sunniest spring on record. Uh, that's enough flowers, back to me. Because <laughs> there's a question about skylarks. I, I, I can love to hear some skylarks. They really seem to be making a comeback. And there are a number of species actually that, um, that are abundant on, on our farm and many other farms around the UK, but we do pay particular attention to them because across Europe, uh, they are, they're a red list species, so they're rare species. Um, we seem to be an absolute hotspot for a number of things from European brown hare, um, uh, great crested newts, 
skylarks etc lots of species like that that are rare in other places but are they're everywhere here and they're an absolute joy to hear the skylark is a remarkable bird in the way that it, it um, it's very distinctive you can not only hear the song like that but when you see a skylark uh, and you know you recognize one it's very you know, it's very easy to recognize they fly almost straight up in the air uh, and they'll hover they'll be hovering up there singing away gosh I don't think I could even see them they're so tiny but um, they're, they're hovering singing away and then they parachute back down so they'll fly a little bit and then they'll just float down they'll fly a little bit and they'll float down um, so they're very distinctive birds it's lovely to see them but even lovelier to hear them and they're nesting across um, our grass fields our pasture and in these fields as well um, Tony I will mention no till um, now's probably a good time to do that um, so we'll probably talk about no-till then we'll go and have a little look in this bit of woodland here uh, we'll pop around the back and we'll look at some more uh, of the work we do to look after the environment and then we'll pop in and see the sheep and we'll go down and see uh, the last pond so we've moved from uh, we've moved uh, we've changed the way that we grow crops on this farm about 15 years ago um, my father changed uh, from a method of full inversion tillage to what we call minimum tillage now that means that every winter um, every field was ploughed and sometimes it was ploughed tw twice. We would plough it and then we'd plough it back again. Now that breaks up the soil, um, it, um, uh, it releases nutrients, um, it, um, uh, it uh, makes the soil nice and light and fluffy and, and it's, it's, quite, it's quite nice and easy for, uh, for crops to grow in. Um, but it really doesn't do a lot of good by it. By, by fully inverting that crop every year. There are certain crops um, that we grow and many other people grow where that kind of thing is required. So a lot of our root vegetables, of course, you have to get a root into the ground. So our sugar beet, uh, potatoes, uh, carrots, onions, that kind of thing, they, you, there needs to be some ploughing involved, although people are experimenting with reducing that. But on the, for the plants that we grow, the crops that you saw earlier on, we don't actually need to move the soil that much at all. So we moved from a full inversion tillage system where we ploughed every year, we churned up the soil to a depth of about four inches. Um, that is, uh, uh, what's that, about um, about 12, to 12 centimetres um, uh, to you uh, millennials and beyond. Um, and we churned the soil up. What we did there was we broke up the structure of the soil. Uh, we removed all the natural drainage channels that are created by the roots and the dead roots and the earthworms. We exposed those earthworms to the air and half of them are eaten by, uh, by seagulls. Um, uh, and actually we often created a pan, so a flat level underneath the soil where water would flow uh, badly through. And you'd think that actually it would be better for drainage, but it's worse for drainage because the, the soil can really um, form a layer at the top, which stops the rain infiltrating. And what we really want to do here, when we get weather uh, like we had in this winter, we want to capture all that lovely rain, get it into the soil as quickly as possible uh, and retain our nutrients. If it flows away, if we have flooding, we lose all those nutrients we've looked at, that we've, um, that we've invested in. Uh, and worse still, they can go into, into our drains and ditches uh, and appear in places that we really don't want them to be. So um, when, we, when we have full inversion, inversion tillage, that can happen. So we move to a system of minimum tillage where we just tickle the top uh, two inches. So the top, uh, what's that? about five, six, eight centimetres of the ground. Um, but in recent years, we've moved to a system where we don't till the ground at all. I'm going to turn the camera around again for a moment because after harvest, uh, with a no-till system, uh, we will let, uh, we will either, we will, well, we'll either plant a cover crop, we'll talk about cover crops in a moment, or we'll just leave the field as it is. So we don't move the soil at all. And as you look here, you can see a lot of straw on the surface. So that is straw from last year's wheat crop uh, and that has lain undisturbed um, throughout the winter and it's actually protected the soil. When we had all that rain, it was falling hard on the soil, but it wasn't washing the soil away because it was being, uh, the soil was being protected by this kind of natural armour, which is the stubble from last year. And when I said it's lying undisturbed, of course it isn't undisturbed because our earthworms are coming up to the surface, they're dragging that soil back down into, into their burrows, they're feasting on the fungi that, um, that are feasting on the, uh, that are breaking down the, um, uh, the straw uh, and they're really helping the, the natural system to work. Um, so we've, we've actually managed to reduce a lot of our runoff. We've seen um, uh, our, soils, our soil health improve um, really, really well. Uh, 
So we've moved to a system uh, called no-till. So we, uh, we don't actually uh, move the soil at all. There's no tillage. Uh, when you, um, if you have a vegetable garden, when you uh, dig the soil over with a spade or with a, uh, with a garden fork, uh, we, we don't actually do anything like that at all. So after the combines left the field, we leave, uh, we leave the, the, the straw like you saw, and the very next implement that will come into the, come into the uh, field is what we call a drill. It's, it's, uh, it's the, the machine that we use for sowing the seeds. And the, each of those drills will have, in, in our case, uh, a little disc English partridge. Lovely. Did you hear them, did you hear them calling out? A very distinctive cheep, 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 cheep in, of English partridge. Amazing to see. We've actually released some here in recent years because we had none at all. Um, and we've, um, that's a great, that's a great joy to see that. But the, uh, let me, I was telling you about the machine that we use to sow our crops. And so it, it has a disc, it has a series of discs. They create a groove in the ground. We blow the seed into that groove and then we just close that little slot up again. So we barely move the soil at all. Uh, and that's absolutely fantastic. It helps reduce our weed, weed burden. Uh, and there are lots of pernicious weeds that we have struggled with and continue to struggle with in our, in our, on our farm. Um, so, uh, so that's fantastic. And we retain the natural drainage. We retain the nutrients. Um, we, we don't have, uh, we, we, we help the water to come into the crop. Um, and we basically have a much healthier, I think, a much healthier soil. We're really trying to build up our soils to increase the organic matter, to protect uh, and encourage the life of the soil. Um, how does the lying um, stubble affect the following crops growth? Um, it shouldn't do at all, Tony, actually. Um, because, we, um, because we use the, the particular drill we use, the, the seed goes straight into the ground, it touches the soil, um, and so the seed grows straight up. And actually the, um, uh, the, 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 the stubble which lies on the surface just helps to protect to, to protect the crops really. Uh, it stops lots of sunlight getting into uh, the ground where the weed seeds might be and might be germinating. So germinating is when a seed starts to grow. Um, but also it retains moisture. So in recent times, uh, if you think back to what I've just shown you, uh, the, the, the stubble, so the bits of straw lying on the ground, will actually help to maintain what little moisture we might have had. So we've, we had some um, early morning dews, and those, that dew, that moisture, can, can persist through the day, um, and it helps to protect the soil. There was some work done on uh, bare soils versus soils that had... Um, we call it trash, but it's not trash. It's really, really important. Had that had that um, vegetative material on it, and uh, in in bright sunlight in uh, in late spring, early summer, soil temperatures can get up to 45 degrees Celsius, uh, and at that point, there's not a lot of biological life uh, happening. Um, but if there's protection on the soil, if there if there's vegetative matter there, the the soil temperatures might be might be 10 or more degrees cooler. So there would be. Um, uh, they might be 35 degrees or, or cooler. Even though they've been baked in the sunshine, the soil's protected, the moisture's retained, the life continues, uh, and if we have a healthy soil, we have healthy plants as well. A question about um, uh, no-till. So did we notice a reduced yield for a year or two after moving to no-till? Uh, and we only actually moved uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and I would say we haven't. Um, uh, I would say there are difficulties with, with changing the way that we grow our crops um, because we have to be a lot more uh, careful. We have to watch our, you know, we have to uh, make sure that we're sowing at the right time. We have to make sure that we are protecting that soil. Um, and you, there can be issues potentially with yield. But we are not hit all about yield here on this farm. We're not trying to uh, be the biggest and the best. Actually, what we need uh, in order to protect our environment and to grow food well is to be profitable. So it might be that we don't grow, uh, we don't have quite the same yield, but if we can, um, if we can reduce perhaps some of the fertilizers we use, uh, we can certainly save a lot of time. Uh, and Jake Freestone, I didn't see the end of his talk earlier, but he often talks um, about how quickly he can, uh, how much time it takes him to establish uh, an acre or a hectare of land. And we can reduce the amount of time that it takes us to get, the, to get the land from the previous harvest to putting a seed in there and making it grow. We can reduce the time from uh, about an hour, over an hour per hectare to, to about 15 to 16 minutes, which is great. So it saves fuel, saves time, it saves uh, wear on machinery, it stops us compacting the soil, making it all dense, um, and uh, it, it's, it's, it basically reduces our costs as well. Um, there's a question, I think that's from Ian, have you considered radishes as part of your, your cover crop rotations with this work and your soil type? Um, we're getting a bit in depth here, so let's just go for the science bit for a minute. So. Uh, radishes are a brassica, uh, as are rapeseeds, some people call that canola. 
uh, and we find that if we have too much too many brassicas in our rotation we change uh, our rotation is the is, is the is the cha is the way that we change the crops in each field each year uh, so we try to only grow on a particular field we only grow um, a brassica crop like uh, our rapeseed one year in seven so if we use brassica crops for our cover crop in between although they're fantastic um, they can harbor some of the pests that take our crops um, uh, from, from our rapeseed. So we really try not to do that, although that's, it's a great thing to use. So um, do search uh, for um, fodder radish um, if, if that's something that you're interested in, in looking at. Um, so it's less to do with soil type and more to do um, with, with our rotation. I'll just talk about our rotation briefly. Um, although I have said that, that uh, there's a comment that, um, that, the, um, that the straw the vegetative matter on the surface that we that we leave can help protect the soil from late frost as well and of course that's absolutely right um, if you remember a couple of years ago we had the beast from the east uh, we had uh, successive frost snows through april uh, and that's the time we really want the soil to be waking up uh, all the biology in the soil all the bacteria the wonderful fungi that are doing their work to be um to be to be starting to be active and to um uh, and to and to get the soil going to help the plants um to, to grab nutrients from the soil and so of course if you've got vegetative matter on that soil it's far better um, for protecting it from from late cross crops um, so our rotation again I introduce you to about six different um, crops that we grow um, earlier on and the rotation is, re is really really important uh, if we just grew for example wheat or rapeseed in the same field year after year after year um, we would generally find that the diseases, the pests, um, the viruses um, would, would increase each year because a pest that eats, uh, for example, rapeseed would just stay in the same place. It would just continue to be there year after year after year. It's growing numbers and causes more problems. We'd end up having to use uh, greater and greater interventions to deal with that, be that physical, um, uh, or chemical or whatever it might be and that's not really what we're about and that's part of our integrated pest management so we rotate so we we change the crops that we have in each field each year and on our farm we don't really have a, a set rotation but we probably if I was to describe it uh, uh, so I'm getting a little bit technical for those who are um, who are non-farmers um, but our rotation would be a winter wheat uh, a winter barley probably winter beans, winter wheat, rapeseed, winter wheat, spring barley, something like that and we go back again. Um, but the rotation just helps the soil to stay alive, it helps uh, to have uh, different nutrients being introduced and taken away by, uh, by the different crops and, uh, uh, and so it's really important. Nature doesn't uh, operate in a monoculture. When you look at this, um, here's another, another area here of our pollen and nectar. Uh, and you look how alive that is. Nature does not like a monoculture, so we try to uh, add much more variety to our crops. So we were earlier, we were the other side of this bit of woodland, weren't we? And we were looking at the, uh, the strip of the pollen and nectar mix that was connecting that woodland with the pond in the middle of the field and the land on the far side. And we've now come the other side and you can see we've got a, you can't see very well actually, but we've got a, a, a large patch uh, of probably about um, four or five hectares. A hectare is 10,000 square meters, so that's 40 or 50,000 square meters of, um, uh, of land that's set aside to grow crops for seeds for our birds in the winter and for a pollen and nectar mix. But what we've done also is we connected that uh, and the woodland with another strip along here uh, with the land at the far end. And in fact, there's a further strip that goes away down the hill to another big, big area of uh, of area that we set aside for, for our wildlife. Um, and that really came about because uh, from a visit from a chap called Matt Shardlow. Um, hello Matt if you're watching. Matt is um, from Bug Life and he and one of the things they have is their beelines um, campaign and whilst this doesn't really classify it account as that um, uh, it, it, it set me thinking and they try to make sure that um, that species have um, habitats as stepping stones. It's important they don't get isolated as we have more roads more housing developments more infrastructure these days we're actually breaking up the habitats um, of our wildlife and whilst we may not be reducing the area for that wildlife, uh, we're, we're breaking the habitats into small areas and we must allow the wildlife to move from one to the other. And so uh, the bug life campaign is called Beelines and they make sure there's habitat throughout the country. But how that works on our farm is we try to connect all of our habitats. I've forgotten to talk about the woodland. Shall I talk about that now or talk about it in a minute? I'll talk about that as we walk through the next field. Um, so we're connecting the woodland 
with the big wildlife area down the far side. We're making sure that our wildlife can get to water, can get to um, food, can get to habitat. But I thought I'd also show you one of my failures, <laughs> uh, of which there have been several this year. We've had um, that, that terrible, terrible wet time in the winter, and then we've had a very dry time through the spring. Um, and actually we've had um, three fields of rapeseed, which are really struggling. They will definitely lose money. One of them, it won't be worth taking the combine into the field. Uh, we've had two fields that we've had to spray off because actually they were so uh, such a poor crop it wasn't worth allowing them to persist uh, and we wanted to then do something else with them and I've got I thought with there, there are probably three or four other fields that either I've made um, bad decisions um, so I've um, uh, I've perhaps taken a bit of machinery into the field at the wrong time when the soil conditions weren't right uh, uh, or, or perhaps we've just been impacted adversely by the weather um, you'll all uh, have experienced in some way or another the, the really wet weather we had through the winter and the very dry uh, weather. Um, on, on our land here we particularly struggle with very very wet weather. Um, hi Ali Hunter Blair. Ali is in the in the west of the country and they have much lighter soils over there so they really struggle when it's very dry but where we are here uh, we did a we, we did an experimental borehole recently uh, well a few years ago and it got to 70 feet deep and it still hadn't got to the bottom of the clay that we have here so we have a very very heavy clay soil now clay is fantastic it holds nutrients uh, it, uh, it it holds water of course we make bowls and things like that out of clay but it uh, it's not very good at uh, allowing water to move through the soil so when we get very wet we get very very wet uh, the, the plus side, and we've experienced that in, few, in recent years where we've had drought times, is it holds on to water a little bit longer. So whilst, when everybody else might have crops that are perhaps dying off or certainly wilting off, our crops generally persist. But now Ali's on the call, I wanted to show you all one of my failures and it was something that I was really trying to, um, uh, trying to do. So I'm quite disappointed by it. You can see a pretty yellow looking field behind me and I'll just turn the camera around. Um, and you see there's still some bits of greenery in there. But my plan for this field was to establish uh, some clover and I used uh, white clover, uh, a subterranean clover and a yellow trefoil. They're three leguminous crop uh, plants and I wanted to establish a crop of that uh, and then every year to plant uh, an arable crop, so probably a spring barley or spring oats, into that field that was covered in clover. So unlike many fields we they would perhaps be bare when we when we establish the next crop I wanted to have a clover crop that I would plant my spring barley into each year um, that would enable me to um, to graze this field during the winter uh, and to have the clover retaining those nutrients putting nitrogen from the atmosphere into the soil uh, and really protecting the soil um, and also it would be help me to produce some more sheep from it. I wanted to then produce um, some spring barley and then maybe after the barley is harvested in August I would let the clover grow up and I might even take a cut of hay or silage. So I was trying to, to, to maximise my output from this, uh, from this, this field um, but also to make sure that there was always a crop, growing crop in it. Nature doesn't like a vacuum, it loves things to be growing all the time and as farmers we're really really trying for that to happen. Sadly this year I, I did establish some, some clover, well, I can point some of that out, uh, you can see it just dying off here. Um, I did establish my spring barley um, very poorly because it was so dry um, uh, actually toward the end of March but there were so many weeds in here that it wasn't worth my continuing unfortunately with this experiment. I will try again, I will not be, uh, uh, not be um, uh, put off. Um, but I ha we had to come and spray this off. Um, now we could have, uh, we didn't actually have to spray it off. We could have um, uh, used some form of tillage uh, and that would have um, turned over the soil, it would have broken up uh, the, the, the weeds, the weed plants, uh, and would it probably let them dry out and, and kill them off. But this field, as we spoke about skylarks earlier, is, is an absolute skylark haven. It's also a lapwing haven. Uh, we often see them up here. Um, and so I knew if I came in and did anything mechanically, so if I moved the soil, uh, then I would be disturbing all kinds of um, ground nesting bird nests. And it's our ground nesting birds we've really struggled with, um, if I'm really honest, um, uh, in the British countryside in recent years. And so I took the decision to use glyphosate to spray it off. As you can see, it's done a, done a pretty good job uh, of killing off um, all those, um, sadly, the clover and the barley, but also the weeds that we had as well. We have a weed called black grass. Uh, let's not talk about it at the moment. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very, very tough competitor, um, but it's killed off all those, those weeds. And what we'll be able to do in just a few weeks time is to plant uh, is to plant a very early crop of, um, uh, of rapeseed. So we're gonna keep 
keep the biology going. Ali Hunter Blair would like to blend our soils together. Gosh, yes, Ali, yes, please. Uh, could you bring me some of your lovely uh, Y Valley, um, those lovely red soils that we saw where you were growing some, um, um, some soya in on Bourne Mucky? If you wouldn't mind bringing those over, that would be absolutely fantastic. So just coming into land now, um, and I say coming into land, we still uh, got another 15 minutes or so. Um, I don't know what time it is, I could just carry on. Um, and if you've got questions, I will carry on. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about woodland. Uh, I'll just get over the, the, um, uh, the fence here and we'll talk about our sheep and then we'll finish with that second pond. Um, this is amazing. I'm, oh, I'm actually really struggling to get through this, um, this pollen and nectar mix. Let's just go right down inside it, shall we? As you can see, there's just so much life here. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, it's grown really tall in a very short period of time. Uh, it's very dense. It's a wonderful habitat. Uh, it's full. I can see all kinds of flies and insects flying off just now. Um, it's, uh, it's got all kinds of different plants as well. Um, and uh, it's a great place to be. Sometimes I just come and hang out up here. Um, if I'm having a bad day. <laughs> I come and just uh, just hang out up here. I just watch watch the wildlife uh, and enjoy this this uh, this part of the farm. Um, it's important. Uh, when we are conservation farmers. We're very environmentally minded. But uh, you know, as I say, whilst this is this is amazing, we can't do this if we don't turn a profit. So it really is important uh, that we as farmers uh, work hard to be as profitable as possible. Um, that we're supported by um, uh, our wonderful government and our population. That's you guys. Um, uh, and if we can be profitable, then we can reinvest in our business and we can make sure that we are looking after areas protecting our wildlife like this. We receive a small check each year. Oh, yeah, I'll be on to you in a moment. We receive a small check each year from the government, which, enable, which basically supports us to take land like this out of production uh, and to, to um, basically um, instigate these, these, um, uh, these uh, wildlife supporting measures. So it's something that we are really proud of, really excited about. Uh, it is a very easy decision for us uh, to, to look after the environment in this way. Um, uh, and it's just a joy. It's an absolute joy. Uh, I hope you've all been out in the countryside recently as we've been allowed to, as lockdown's broken, uh, as, uh, has um, relaxed slightly. It's very important. You'll notice I haven't got my dog with me, my trusty friend. Um, I keep him very, very far away from anywhere where there might be nesting birds at this time of year. Uh, and I'm always very careful where he is. Um, you should definitely be trying to do the same, please, if you're in the countryside. Uh, ideally, if you keep your dog on a lead, it would be fantastic. Even if you look at a field and it looks pretty empty, like this field behind me, you might think, well, it's okay, I'll let my dog run around in there because there's nothing in there. But of course there is something in there. We've spoken a lot about skylarks. And that field is full of skylarks. It looks like an empty field. It looks like the kind of place you might just let your dog have a run around. But the number of nests, of ground nesting birds, you could be disturbing just by that simple, relatively innocent act um, uh, is um, really not that good for our wildlife. So do, um, do keep your dog on a lead. Do pick up his poo as well, um, because we're now moving into a grass field and um, within farming, we see some wonderful, joyous things and we see some terrible, harrowing and heinous things and uh, one of the most um, one of the things that, that stuck with me the longest um, uh, is there was a sheep a few years ago that died from uh, a disease that affects the brain uh, and it's transmitted by dog feces um, it uh, it basically drives them mad it takes a long time to kill them um, they go they walk around in circles they go into convulsions they lose um, all their faculties, um, but they die very slowly, and I'm sure it's it's a, it's a terrible, terrible way to die. Um, uh, and that is transmitted by your dog poo. So even if you see a, an empty grass field, this one's obviously got a few of our um, uh, uh, of our sheep friends. Um, even if you see an empty grass field, it's not a great place for your dog to be because, of course, the farmer might well move his uh, his sheep, his flock into that field. Um, just a few hours even or a few minutes after you've passed. Now we're down here on the uh, in the sheep meadow um, you can see it looks um, it looks like it's got lots of lines in it and that is that is it's true on our farm we generally don't cut hay or silage um, so that's when you cut the grass and you bale it up um, and you take it away for, for animal feed we generally don't do that until um, uh, about the first of July and that's because again for our ground nesting birds so we try and let uh, we try not to to to, um, to cut hay at that point but we have I have made an, an exception 
and it's really important that um, uh, that we're on top of our farm at all times. I have made an exception here. Um, I did walk around the field, there weren't that many ground nesting birds. Basically, if you've got that lovely great habitat out there, um, why would you be in a grass field when you could, uh, when you could be in that? Um, so there weren't uh, that many ground nesting birds, and in fact the grass wasn't particularly long, um, but it was a little bit too long for our sheep. One of the issues we have with our sheep, we obviously try to maintain um, their health and welfare, uh, one of the issues we get is lameness, and that's basically like athlete's foot. Uh, they'll often get a little bit of grass or muck or poo caught between their hooves, and when it gets in there and they can't get it out, um, uh, then, uh, then, then, they, then they get lame. Um, uh, so we try to um, try to protect our, our sheep health as much as possible by keeping the grass short. So I cut, took a crop of uh, hay, um, uh, and uh, and that's as you can see, the sheep are very happy. Um, I'm just winding up here, so I think I've got a note. Thank you, Tom, for a wonderful insight. Um, uh, the next farm will be live in eight minutes. So I will just finish by talking about woodland, um, a little bit about sheep uh, and about our pond. So we've got a bit of woodland up there. That's called our Millennium Wood. Everyone who lived in our little village uh, at the time of the millennium planted one oak tree within that woodland. And we've, and in the next, last generation, we planted about 14 or 15 bits of woodland like that. Um, some with support from the Woodland Trust, thanks guys, uh, and others um, off our own bat. Uh, it's just something that we love to see um, uh, and is an important part of our landscape, particularly as we lost at the Elms uh, in the 70s and the 80s and now as we're um, looking down the barrel of ash dieback. So we're trying to, um, to preempt the loss of some of those ash trees. Um, we are um, just coming down to our pond. We're in our field of sheep. We generally buy in ewes and lambs, or we buy in uh, young lambs later in the year to fatten them through for, uh, for, for lamb meat. As you can see, we've just sheared them. We sheared them a couple of weeks ago when it was really hot. They were, as you imagine, very grateful to, um, to have lost their wool. But one of the funny things that always happens at that time of year is that when the, the, when the sheep, when the mothers have been sheared, when, they've, when, we've, when we've cut their fleece off them, they come through, uh, and they look very different. So of course, while they recognize their lambs, their lambs don't recognize them. So there's all the melee and lots of bleating and everything going on. The mothers are saying, it's me, you idiot. And the lambs are saying, oh, where's my mum? Uh, they don't recognize them. So um, that's, um, <laughs> that's, that's always a pretty funny time. But um, uh, I did promise I'd finish with the second pond. This was a pond that we dug out um, a few months before that pond that we saw earlier. We uh, also maintained that green bridge. We only dug out 90% of it and we left um, the final 10%. And I'll just show you now. This is the site of our Open Farm Sunday last year, actually, where we welcomed people. We did some pond dipping. It was all fantastic. We had a nature walk uh, and a farm tour as well. And I built this platform so we could go into the middle of this pond. And this pond was recently described by Natural England as abundant and diverse. So uh, as you can see, this was dug out about 18 months ago and already it's grown back. So that's absolutely fantastic. The wildlife is, uh, is, um, uh, is having a great time and that's really what we're about. So thank you all for watching. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for the questions and the interaction. Uh, thank you for um, just, just hanging out with me. Uh, and thank you for supporting British farmers. It really is important uh, that if we can remain profitable, we can look after our beautiful countryside. And so when you're buying British, uh, when you're looking for the red tractor mark, when you're looking for the leaf mark, you are, you're basically having a mark of an assurance uh, of the way that we uh, look after uh, our livestock, the way we protect and raise our crops, but also the way we steward the environment. And that is the environment that's around you guys, our wonderful consumers. So by buying British, uh, you are investing in the countryside around you. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I'll doff my cap to you. Um, although I've still got my uh, lockdown haircut, so I won't do that too much. Um, thank you so much for being with me and I'll hand over now to the next farmer. Have a great day, everybody. Bye from us here.